but just uh, so I I just want to welcome you. I'm sure most of you know me, but I'm Anne Marie Quinn. I'm the IPA Executive Director, and on behalf of the webinar planning group, we are so delighted that so many have joined us today. We have we are gathered from across the IPA network and beyond. I have just I just see Pat Davis coming in from San Francisco, where it's 4:30 in the morning, and uh, also our sisters are in from New Zealand, where it's 1:30 on the on November 24th. So thank you for for coming from across the globe. Many of you joined us last year for our webinar entitled "Empowered in Advocating for the Elimination of Violence Against Women and Children." And I'm sure Despina is going to just put up the photograph to recall that event. Thank you, Despina. We have now just reached 100 uh, participants. So I know it's quite difficult to spot you, but you are there. Uh, just one year ago, it, 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 our event took place on 24th last year. Violence against women and girls is one of the most widespread, persistent and devastating human rights violations in our world. So today, our webinar is titled Building Stronger Together Towards Elimination of Violence Against Women and Children. Violence is a threat to millions of young girls and women online and offline. Women continue to be an obstacle to achieving equality. Violence against women continues to be an obstacle to achieving equality, development, peace, as well as to the fulfillment of women and girls' human rights. All in all, the promise of the sustainable goals to leave no one behind cannot be fully, cannot be fully fulfilled without putting an end to violence against women and girls. To raise awareness, this year's UN's theme is Orange the World and Violence Against Women Now. Orange is our color to represent a brighter future free of violence against women and girls. So as we begin our time together, I invite you to join in a collective moment of remembrance. Remembering those who have passed away during the past year and all of those who have suffered loss. We take a moment to honor those feeling the consequences of the pandemic. We take a moment to think with gratitude of all who keep things going in this crisis, particularly those on the front lines. We take a moment to reflect on the situations in our own locations and in our own lives. And we pray together. Please read. Lord of life and love, <coughs> as we give thanks for time past, grant us courage to embrace the present and grace to share the future. In memory of loved ones dear, keep their flame to shine in the dark, to light the path ahead. Show the way that leads to life, cherish days gone by, 
and inspire and us with a touch of love, the touch of love and hope that we can live on. Amen. 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 Thank you, Despina. Despina, maybe you'd wait for a moment. Thank you at the slides. So I just have, first of all, a few IT matters that we are recording this webinar. Uh, the recording will take place for the presentations, but not for the open session. And it will later be on the IPA YouTube. So if you're more comfortable not to have yourself seen, just turn off your video, thank you. We plan to take a photo shot too, and we'll let you know when it's happening. But again, if you prefer not to have your photo taken, please turn off your video at that time. The microphones will be muted during the presentations, but, but you're very welcome to put any questions into the chat box and they will be addressed during, again during the open session. 2021 has been a challenging and unusual year for all of us, but the global pandemic has spurred us on to be even more involved with the work of justice. We will share now just a glimpse of ways in which presentation members and people have been advocating for ending violence against women and children during the past year. In Thailand, Sister Jansi has been working in collaboration with the Good Shepherd Sisters on human trafficking. During a 10 week training program on human rights, organized by Edmund Rice International and attended by many presentation people, Jancy shared with the course participants on, the, on her work and the Good Shepherd's work in relation to violence against women and children in her mission in Thailand. On the 25th of each month, the Aberdeen South Dakota Sisters wear orange to bring awareness to the issues of violence against women and children. As I own a presentation college in Western Australia, Young Prezi Service Group engage in an education and advocacy project around how women and children specifically are impacted by homelessness. The Buke Justice Promotion Team. Next slide, please, Despina. Thank you. The Dubuque Justice Promote, Promoter Team invites us to join them on their journey to justice as they commit to see with new eyes what is happening in the world, to pray for God's wisdom, guidance, and to act. Their Justice Action for November offers education on how mental illness and violence interact, intersect, particularly in the lives of women. Sister Lisa in Goa and in India works with a network of Catholic sisters fighting human trafficking across the globe. And shortly, you will hear more from the chairpersons of the IPA priority action groups on how we are responding to honoring the rights of women and children, earth, indigenous and tribal peoples, and the interlinkages of these priority actions with our UN advocacy focus, elimination of violence against women and children. But now I would like to invite you, to invite our IPA NGO representative at the UN, Dr. Despina Aphrodite Malaki, to update you on the IPA advocacy work at the UN at global level, particularly on IPA's advocacy on the elimination of violence against women and children. I'd also like to point out at this point that the Spina is multitasking today, presenting being just one of her many tasks. So it's over to you, the Spina, please. Thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. And thank you everyone for being here today, joining us. Um, good morning from New York, uh, good afternoon or good evening to uh, those of you who are um, connecting from different uh, time zones. Uh, we are gathered here today on the occasion of the elimination of the International Day of, uh, for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, which is celebrated every year um, uh, on November 25th. 
Just some useful uh, info here that this year, the official UN Commemoration Day and the event uh, for this uh, day will take place on November 24th uh, instead of the 25th at 10 a.m. and will be available live on uh, UN uh, Web TV. And now, uh, from November 25th uh, to December 10th, the United Nations is marking the 16 days of uh, uh, activism against the gender-based violence, a global campaign aiming to raise awareness for preventing and uh, ending uh, all forms of violence against women and girls in all parts of the world. As Anne-Marie uh, mentioned uh, earlier, the global theme for this year's campaign is Orange the World and Violence Against Women Now. Uh, as in previous years, the color, uh, you know, the orange color uh, will be used to represent a brighter future free from violence. Uh, and as a unifying uh, theme uh, running through all the global activities. I know that we are pressed for time, so I will immediately provide a brief update on the initiatives that I undertook this past year at the UN. But I will share with you uh, uh, only those activities that were relevant uh, to our specific focus on the elimination of violence against women and children. Um, so, uh, following our previous gathering last year, one year ago actually, um, the IPA kicked off uh, the 16 days of activism. Uh, that the campaign for, um, uh, uh, ran from the UN. Uh, we kicked off that campaign for the NGO committee to stop trafficking in persons uh, mm -hmm. with relevant interactive posts on Twitter. Uh, just to note at this point that um, Twitter is the main uh, social media platform that the UN uses for advocacy and engagement. And uh, we also decided to turn our organization's logo on Twitter to orange until the end of uh, the 16 days campaign, showing to the UN agencies and member states that we say no uh, to gender-based violence. Um, we also submitted written statements, both for the UN Commission on the Status of Women in 2021 and um, the UN Commission for Social Development in 2022. Uh, actually, the submission was uh, this uh, October for uh, the next uh, February. Uh, both um, written statements focusing on the intersections of gender-based violence with the various aspects of each priority theme. Uh, both statements were endorsed by many NGOs uh, as well, and uh, both religious and non-religious NGOs. Um, now, during the respective online gatherings of February and March, with our beloved uh, justice contacts, uh, we aim to empower them further by explaining the interlinkages between the IPA focus on gender-based violence uh, with the indigenous tribal people and the care of the earth. Um, in March, uh, we held uh, within the NGO uh, Commission uh, on the Status of Women Forum, a webinar aiming to, to make the uncomfortable conversation comfortable um, and discuss uh, the pathways uh, of changing gender stereotypes. We were joined by nine distinguished speakers uh, to be precise, uh, two ambassadors from Thailand and Portugal, two high-ranking uh, national officials from the Philippines and Peru, uh, one officer from the UNDP, uh, one academic expert from England, and two executive directors from civil society from the US and India, and also one gender-based violence survivor. It's important to mention these details in order to highlight how um, the IPA global presence uh, was enhanced and our work was promoted at the, at the international and, um, and UN level. Um, in May, we developed and launched a, a booklet as a guiding document uh, that provides information and tools uh, to be used when addressing, uh, advocating or preventing violence against women and children. This was also distributed uh, to the wider civil society community here at the UN. Uh, my presentation will be available to you after the webinar, so you will have the opportunity to, to access the links that, uh, that you see here at, at your own convenience. Um, so following our commitment to build up, we have initiated a new partnership with the Red Dot Foundation on the Safe City Project. I'll provide more details on that uh, during the relevant uh, webinar segment a, a, a bit later. Uh, the IPA research 
gender stereotypes and domestic violence began almost two months ago in October. Um, but I will let Ella, our new research fellow, give you more details later, uh, later on um, regarding what we are doing there. And uh, last but not least, I would like to provide you with some IPA logos on gender-based violence, which were created last spring, and they will be available to you. Um, I mean, you are free and welcome to use them in your work on gender-based violence. Uh, thank you for listening for now. <laughs> Anne-Marie, back. Thank you, Despina. And uh, Despina, now I invite you to introduce um, uh, Elizabeth and Jacqueline, please. Thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Um, so at this point, I would like to introduce to you uh, Elizabeth and Jacqueline. Uh, Elizabeth uh, is a presentation sister and pastoral worker in ITAP, uh, Papua New Guinea. And Jacqueline is uh, 20 years old. She's also a student at St. Ignatius Secondary School. Um, they will share with us a very touching story. Uh, Jacqueline has experienced trauma and abuse in her life. Um, and Elizabeth has been there to support her and help her in any way and every way. Um, thank you both for joining us today. I will also invite Anne Lane, um, our society president and leader of PNG community to, to chime in if need be at any point uh, during their presentation since she's very close to both our speakers today. Um, okay, Jacqueline, you have the floor. Jacqueline, Elizabeth. Are you there? Despina, I think you need to mute them. They're there, all right, Despina. Just to mute. There they are now. I'm on. Uh, yeah, okay. Yes, yes, Elizabeth, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Jacqueline. I'm from Mandy, Southern Islands province, Papua New Guinea. I'm 20 years old. Last year I did my year 11 in Mandy, Southern Islands province, Papua New Guinea. I had a boyfriend, which was a married man, but I did, didn't know that he was a married man. One day I went to school and busy doing my school activities inside the classroom. Then a woman came in and beat me in the classroom. Then I realized that the wife of that man. At that moment, the school rejected me and my family and relatives also rejected me from their homes. I have no way to go. So I followed a woman from another village to live with her family. During the Christmas holiday, Sister Elizabeth Seb is my cousin sister. She came holiday and heard about my story. And then she feels sad and one day she came to where I live to visit me. Then she feels sad and when she heard about my story, she feels sad and went back to home. After some weeks, she rang me and told me to come to Aitape, Sundown Province, which now I'm living with the Presentation Sisters here in Aitape, Papua New Guinea. When I came here, the presentation sisters provide me with food, shelter, and everything that I need. They treat me like their real sister. And I feel like they are my real family and sisters. No more sadness in my life. They help me in spiritual, and in physical side of my life. They seek space for me 
in St. Ignatius Secondary School here in Aitape, Sandown Province. Now I'm continue doing my grade 11 here in St. Ignatius. Next year I'm going to do my year 12. I am very happy with the presentation sisters. Thank you so much, the presentation sisters. It's coming from my heart. Thanks, Jacqueline. I have nothing much to give, but uh, God, but the good Lord will bless you from whatever you have done in my life. Thank you so much. And Thank God you, bless. Jacqueline. And <laughs> bye. Bye. Elizabeth, would you like to tell bye. us your part of the story? Uh, last year was my last year was my visit. And when I went home, uh, I have family members, we are cousins. So I lived with their family, the parents, and uh, they told me the story. So I felt sad about her. So I was looking for her where she was. And then somehow I went and meet her where she was. Elizabeth, may I recommend you to uh, turn off your video in order to optimize our, our quality sound? Elizabeth, you're freezing. So you know how sometimes you have to turn off your sound when you're freezing. But you can keep on talking. It's don't, don't turn off your sound, sorry. Turn, turn off, off the video. video, turn off the video. Yes, turn off the video, Elizabeth. Yeah, oh yes, please. Yeah. And now you can keep talking, Elizabeth. We'll still be able to hear you. We might have lost her time. I better. think we I, I think we have lost her for a moment. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Um, okay, I would uh, suggest Anne Marie to, to move yes. forward. And, I, will, uh, I will move forward and maybe we might get Elizabeth uh, shortly again, you know, when if we keep an eye out for coming back on, on again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to now uh, move on to our the work of our focus groups. Uh, in order to continue with the ongoing development and implementation of the IPA plan, we formed three focus groups and each has a chairperson. So I'm going to invite Gemma Thompson, chair of the women and children's focus group to share on the work of the group. Gemma is a justice contact of Western Australia. So welcome Gemma and over to you. There you are. Thanks Anne-Marie. I'll just wait for the slides just been, thank you. Wonderful. So it's a great pleasure to share with you the work of our focus group um, for women and children this evening. And I'll just start by saying that we were really inspired by the Education and Action for Justice Plan um, produced by IPA. And it's allowed us really to focus the work of our, our group on honouring and advancing the rights of women and children with a specific focus on ways to eliminate violence against women and children. So as we all know, as presentation people around the world, we are called to work collaboratively, innovatively, and using a non-violent approach. Together as a focus group, we've identified the interlinkages between the systemic root causes of gender-based violence and how it manifests in our respective local contexts. So as I said, on behalf of our focus group, it's my pleasure to share with you a brief snapshot of some of the interlinkages this evening using a, a model that is respond, advocate and prevent. And some of you may be familiar with the IPA booklet that was published in May of this year um, of a similar title. 
So in terms of response, we feel called to respond to the call to eliminate violence against women and children by providing support. So we've partnered with local organisations, presentation sisters and networks in our respective context to provide a variety of supports to women and children impacted by violence. An example includes the work of our sisters in Papua New Guinea. There continues to be an increased number of young women needing support with referrals and pastoral support because of gender-based violence, both at home and in the community. In terms of advocating, we advocate for eliminating violence against women and children by strengthening our partnerships and networks globally and locally and encouraging information sharing. So to give you a snapshot in Queensland, uh, in Australia, a secondary school has proactively engaged in a partnership with the Refugee Council of Australia to partake in what it calls its Work and Welcome Program. It's an employment program that provides refugees and migrants with paid work experience and the staff contribute via regular contributions from their wages. We're very aware that migrant and refugee women can often experience barriers leaving their environments due to domestic violence. As a focus group, we share information to review how violence manifests in our local contexts, and we've examined the root causes through surveying data. As a result, we are even more aware that this is the systemic root causes of violence against women and children are so intrinsically interlinked. In terms of prevention, we continue to seek to prevent and eliminate hopefully violence against women and children by building capacity, raising awareness and improving access to learning. So we build capacity in our focus group in ourselves through our own education, our contributions and active participation in local and international webinars such as this one, but particularly through information sharing in our respective networks. We all acknowledge that knowledge is power in seeking to address the root causes of gender-based violence. We're also acutely aware of the power of education as a vehicle for transformation. Hence, we've sought to raise awareness through planned justice simulation activities pertaining to violence. And this has been exemplified by our sisters and associates in Dubuque in Iowa, who have been given real life scenarios with suitable ramifications to give participants an idea of the insights into the frustrations of women and children and the challenges when they need to flee a violent situation. We also continue to seek to improve access to learning for all people, particularly young people in primary, secondary and tertiary institutions. We've learned of the wonderful work occurring at Villanova University in the States to reduce unconscious bias against women to create a learning environment that promotes equality. So our challenge to you as a focus group is to join us on this journey to build a stronger future for all women and children around the world and as Helen Keller says, and as you can see on the screen, alone we can do so little, but together we can do so much. Thank you. Thank you, Gemma, and to the members of that focus group. And indeed, as you have just quoted together, ye have done so much to honor and advance the rights of women and children, especially with, with a specific focus on education. So now I invite all just to pause to honour the work being done on behalf of all of us at Local 11 by this group. The theme of next year's commission, 66 Commission on the Status of Women is Achieving Gender Equality and the Empowerment of All Women and Girls in the Context of Climate Change, Environment, and disaster risk reductions, policies and programs. Our second advocacy focus group, Honouring the Rights of Earth, will have a lot to contribute to this team. I now invite Brian O'Toole, Chairperson of the Rights of Earth focus group, to tell us how the work, how the group is working in the intersections of justice for the earth and the elimination of violence against women and children. Brian is a justice contact for Ireland and England. Over to you, Brian, please. Thank you, Anne-Marie, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody who's joined us on this call this morning. Um, I'm one of nine justice contacts who, as Anne-Marie has pointed out, I am a member of the second focus group, which looks at advancing the care and rights of the earth 
and we reach out into the community to assist to facilitate in the lives of those women and families among whom we live and work. When we come together, which we do on a monthly basis, we came to realize that so much of what we do is done by women, for women and for children. In our group, we recognize that women are in many places, the second sex, but they are the primary teachers. They are the farmers, the gatherers of food, water and fuel. Women are better leaders in times of crisis. Women think for the collective first. Women are powerful organizers. They have solutions. And we, we, we see this too when we list, listen to their lived experience. Women turn knowledge into action. But women are excluded from education, from politics. They may lack the resources. They may lack the financial means and the ownership rights. Women remain trapped. But when we look to care for our common home, we find that women are to the fore. If you look here at this slide, you see Greta Thunberg, Mary Robinson, Jane Goodall and Mia Motley, the Prime Minister of Barbados, a standout speaker at COP26. There is an interesting intergenerational understanding and handover. There is a unity and an awakening. Women are challenging those in authority, the men. And this point was never more starkly noticeable than at the G7, when you see there was only one woman present. And again, at the recent COP26, one of the daily themes of COP26 was women and girls. And it is recognized that the effects of climate change disproportionately affect women and children. This is something we in presentation have long been aware of. Women work in farms while boys are in school. As the climate change worsens, so does the plight of women. Women are custodians of the land that is primarily owned by men. 1% of land is owned by women. Women, when women fall hungry, families suffer. Women are excluded from discussions about climate change. Women are taken up with the time consuming work of caring for children, gathering food and, and also in agriculture. And they have too little time for taking action on climate change. In our focus group, we find that much of what we do is leading by example, or indeed practically supporting women in our local communities, women working for and with women and children, empowering and educating, supporting women and raising the esteem of the next generation. Women are being taught new ways, maximum yield, minimum field. They're being offered unused provincial land. They are being provided with solar energy investment by the presentation sisters. In, they're helped and to understand and learn about using kitchen waste for biogas, which is also used for cooking, perhaps even in honey beekeeping. The installation of a paper cycling or recycling machine offers a learning and independence that liberates all. We also provide training on the SDGs for all waste management awareness programs, digital training for all as the digital divide is huge. We teach young girls and women the issues of global citizenship education that provoke activism, that inspire fairness and demand opinion and lead to an action that changes. Collaboration is a big part of the work that we do. In Australia, for example, we are working in solidarity with the Pacific Island nations to address the effects of climate change. We helped and sent a Pacific Islander delegates to the COP26. Sister Lynn Crilly spoke to us previously of the sustainable work of air and earth at our last webinar. In Chiang Mai, we see classes on climate education, waste management, water conservation, and education in herma medicines, primarily to women, empowering as we go. In Ireland and England, we lead by example with bog restoration and linking this action with others that we teach and engage students in the SDGs and in their transformative power. We advocate and lobby for the traffic as part of a collaboration with others and presenting at the CSW 65. We lobby strategically by taking the time to submit on Ireland's universal periodic review on trafficking, domestic violence, asylum seekers, refugees and migrants. 
The participatory rural appraisal scheme is a new approach that incorporates the knowledge and opinions of rural farming people, mainly women, with regards to the effect of climate change, so that what they learn, they can put into effect in order to mitigate the future difficulties and adapt to um, the next problems that come with climate change. In some way or other, we're all taking part in the Laudato Si Action Platform. And this has been the case for nearly 40 years. We integrate Laudato Si in practical ways as we do in Newfoundland. Our aim is to bring new, uh, Laudato Si to life in communities like New Zealand and in South America in ways that empower women as they make practical and important differences to their lives and the lives of their children as they care for the earth. In every country, we study and reflect on the SDGs and their implementation, remembering the importance of SDG 18, prayer. COVID has made the world a more dangerous place for women and children. And you can see how Aberdeen have taken up this idea of creating billboards to act, causing us to notice. We are reminded that there will be no peace on earth until we make peace with the earth and women are ideally placed to take the lead on this objective. So the importance of empowering women in the care of the earth is our way of raising the important voices of women, ensuring that they will be heard and heard loudly. Thank you very much. Brian, Mila Margot, a million thanks to yourself and to the members of your group. I just saw the caption at the end there, if I could be of service in any part of the world. So IPA is of service in any part of the world as you brought out in your presentation. I just also thought of your group last week when I attended a webinar in preparation for the 66th session of the Commission of Staff of Women, which happens next March. And the title of that webinar was Violence Against Earth is Violence Against Women and Children. So once again, I invite all to pause to honor what is happening at local level across IPA work network and to honor the care of the earth and elimination of violence against women and children. And thirdly, I invite Sister Maureen O'Connell, Chair of the Focus Group on Indigenous and Tribal People, to share with, her, with us the interventions being undertaken for the rights of Indigenous and Tribal People. Maureen is a member of the Congregational Coordinating Team for Justice in Union. Over to you, Maureen, and thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie, and good, uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to all of you. And uh, I just want to introduce the members of our group uh, with, uh, with the IPA Priority Action to Honour and Advance the Rights of Indigenous and Tribal People. And Jansi in Thailand, Pat in the USA, Shamila in, in Pakistan, who recently replaced Chazia, and myself, I'm in Ireland, and I've been with the group for about four months. So we have been identifying the locations of presentation people who are journeying with Indigenous and Tribal People and in this map, the next uh, slide will just show you the places who have been reporting to us on Zoom sessions about their work with Indigenous and tribal people. So North India, South India, Pakistan, Philippines, Thailand, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Ecuador, San Francisco, where the sister support pro projects with Indigenous people in Mexico, Guatemala and Peru. And Ireland and England, where they work with uh, in ethnic Irish travellers and immigrants. And lastly, Slovakia, where they work with the Roma people. Now, we are aware that there are other locations in the IPA network where presentation people are also engaging with Indigenous and tribal people, and we will be continuing to reach out to those. In identifying the interlinkage of gender-based violence and the rights of Indigenous people and tribal people, we began by looking at interventions by presentation people. And it was through formal and non-formal education that they do it through literacy and, and numeracy, through health and wellness programs, and one such program in the Philippines was actually funded from the IPA Project Fund in 2019 on the Eradication of Poverty Day. And you see in the picture here, 
that project in the Philippines. Actually, the picture is not there at all. It was meant to be there. Um, the sustainable development yeah. the, the, the project in the Philippines that was funded. Um, they also have a big, particular focus on the SDGs in all the locations because of the overarching theme, leave no one behind. And as we all know, Indigenous and tribal people are among the those left furthest behind. So our sisters and, and co colleagues work with them to make them aware of the SDGs and what's in the SDGs to, in relation to their lives and their livelihoods. There's also skills training on leadership and partnership, and especially self-help groups in South India. You can see here in the next slide, Sister Suda working with women from the village in, in promoting them to be self-sufficient, independent, and to work in partnership. And they started their own enterprise, a milk society at village level, where the women organized to send milk from their village to a district milk society. And they share the profits among themselves and they do all their own financial accounts. Then there's also the children's parliament in India, which are, uh, and you can see Sister Suda again in the next picture, and a uh, village par uh, parliament, and they train the children to voice their concerns and needs and bring them to the village decision makers. And then the next one is actually indigenous migrants, um, which, which is asylum seekers, refugees, migrant workers, and victims of trafficking. And Thailand and Ireland, England had specific mention of these groups. And they reach out to assist them in any way they can if, if there are any difficulties they encounter as they work with them. And from all the reports we received, it's obvious that the commitment and dedication of many presentation people over 20 and 30 years have borne much fruit. We highlight some examples. But what's related here about the Philippines is actually true of, of work going on in all the other locations. But the specific uh, highlight in the Philippines was that they showed that students who were educated now help the wider community to seek and exercise their rights. And children who previously dropped out of school are now the supportive parents of a new generation. And then graduates are role models in the community, speaking up for themselves and for those who have still, have still not found their voices for, and struggling for their right to place in society. And you can see a picture of these students in the Philippines at a, an education and training session. And the next picture shows young bad joy children who had a struggle to adjust to this culture in public schools and they were dropping out from school. So the sisters and their colleagues set up a, a preschool exclusively for them to prepare them to master skills needed in the public school, like learning the dialect of the majority and ensuring that they attain the basic literacy and numeracy skills that are needed for the public school. And then is another uh, example from the Philippines, this, the Badja Council, which collaborates with the Presentation Sisters Education Program, the community leaders there originally were all men. But they had a, prob a problem because they didn't have literacy and numeracy skills, so they had to employ a woman who did. And governance now shows from what it was originally with one woman among all the men to what it is now with women and young people taking their rightful place in leadership. And they say it's all a work in progress, but women and children are continuing to grow in confidence. And then, as Des as Despina said at the very beginning about the United Nations and bringing the experiences from grassroots to the United Nations, Indigenous and tribal people do that, especially recently on the International Day of the Girl Child. Mm. And I'll finish with just uh, to tell you that our group's work is, going, is ongoing, and it's our intention to invite presentation people from Australia, New Zealand, Peru and Chile, and any other locations not mentioned here, to share their experiences with us as well between the gender-based violence and the rights of Indigenous and tribal people among whom they work. And we'll also be encouraging them to participate in future relevant UN campaigns. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, and thank you to the members of, of the group. Uh, and as Maureen mentioned, Maureen is relatively new into the group and has taken on the chair. And, uh, and I thank her for, for that. So maybe we just again pause and honour what is happening at local level uh, through the interventions of those uh, involved. And now I'm going to hand back to Despina uh, and Despina will welcome Anshu and uh, Sister Libania.
Thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Before going into our uh, group from India, is Elizabeth there? I could, I just checked now, I couldn't see her. Yeah, yeah she is. She's oh, back. Oh, she, oh, Grace, Grace, Grace. She's back to Spain. Great. Well, maybe, maybe we take Elizabeth then and, uh, yeah, and Jacqueline. In. Thank you. Elizabeth, um, can you? Yes. OK, go ahead, Elizabeth, please. Hello? We can hear uh, you, can Elizabeth, you after you go. I went and add about it. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hello. Yes. Okay. I continue on with my story. I went and found Jacqueline at uh, the woman's place where she was. So I went and I asked the certificates. And when she told me a story, I was in TS and um, when I came back, I asked her for a certificate and acceptance letter and so on with the um, education, to do with the education. So I brought those things with me to Itape. And then I told my uh, this story, Jacqueline's story to my sisters, especially Anne, our leader, and my sisters in Itape. So they all agreed and uh, I went and seek space for Jacqueline's education at St. Ignatius Secondary School. And um, principal accepted her. So that's how we, the presentation sisters invite Jacqueline to come and stay with us here in Itape to continue with the education. And now she's living with us here. And when hearing Jacqueline's story and living with Jacqueline and experiencing what has had happened to her, there are many more in, in our community and next doors and at the school, at the society, everywhere we are. And it's a very challenging for us. And especially as a pastoral worker, it's really challenging here yeah? that how, how will I help them or how can we help these women and girls who are experiencing violence? And uh, it is a big challenge. So as Nano did, we as the presentation sisters, we presentation sisters and presentation people, we work together, pray together for these women and girls who are experiencing this difficult situation in their lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Thank you. And, and to Jacqueline. Thank, Thank you, Despina. Thank you. Thank you to both Jacqueline and Elizabeth. Um, I mean, I can only say one thing that survivors of violence, they deserve justice and nothing less. And we need to speak up uh, when someone uh, crosses the line every time and everywhere. Um, let's not allow silence to be compliance to a culture of violence, right? Uh, okay, so uh, I would like now to present to you uh, another lived experience to human voices coming from India. Um, we have the pleasure to have with us today Sister Sniha and Anshu. She's, sister Sniha is a presentation sister in North India province, and she's also practicing law in uh, Delhi High Court. Anshu comes from a small village in, in the northern part of India, and she's currently in her second year of law studies. Um, she too, like um, Jacqueline, has experienced the abuse and violence in her life and Sister Sniha was there to support her in the healing process. I welcome you both uh, and I invite you to take the floor. Um, but before that, I need to say that Libania Fernandez, our justice contact of North India province, uh, was kind enough to volunteer into helping us out uh, with the si simultaneous translation from Hindi to English. And we sincerely thank you for that, Libania. So Anshu, uh, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Espana. Sure. Sneha has to unmute her mic, please. Sneha, unmute. Yeah, I'm doing, yes. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good evening. And, and good afternoon to everyone. OK. मेरा नाम अंशु झा है मैं इंडिया से बिहार स्टेट से बिलोंग करती हूं 
My name is Anshu Jha and I come from Bihar state in India. Okay, my wedding was in 17 years old in 2005. I got married in 2005 at the age of 17 years. At that time, my qualification was only 10th class. At that time, my qualification, educational qualification was only 10th class. After my marriage, I stayed in the village with my in-laws for four years. After that, I moved to Delhi with my husband. Delhi आके 2009 में मैंने एक daughter को जन्म दी। In 2009 I gave birth to a baby girl। हाँ, उसके बाद one month के बाद फिर से मैं गांव चली गई, husband के Again I went to my village with my daughter। हाँ, वहाँ फिर मैं दो साल रही, village में दो साल रही। I stayed in the village for two years after that. Uh, two years ke baad fi husband ne mujhe Delhi le aaye. My husband brought me back to Delhi after two years. Uh, to, uske baad meri uh, uh, admission karwa di aage ke law college mein. My husband, mein my husband got, got admitted in the college for my further studies after that. Yes, lekin meri a study pura nahi hui. Since my husband went to Spain for his further studies, I was unable to complete my studies. My study complete legal paper In 2013, my husband appeared suddenly in India. And he asked me to sign some papers, some legal papers, and that for the admission of my daughter. This is what I was told. Agar husband ne kaha sign nahi karegi, to tumhe four lakhs rupees dene padegi. My husband said, if I don't sign the papers, you will have to pay rupees four lakhs. That is rupees four hundred thousand. Ah, pressure me aake, maine first sign legal paper pe kar di. I was uh, frustrated and so I uh, signed the papers outside the court, not in the court. After signing these papers, my husband went back to Spain for his studies. फिर 2014 में आया सेकेंड पेपर पे वो साइन ले लिया मुझे फाइनल मुझे नहीं पता था वो मेरी डाइवोर्स ठीक दी है He came back to India in 2014 from Spain and he asked me to sign the papers a second time I was not aware that these papers were divorce papers उसके बाद वो उसकी जॉब लग गई विप्रो कंपनी में सैलरी थी one lakh fifty thousand. After this, he got a job in a Wipro company, and his salary was one and a half lakh. Was uh, four month ke liye Singapore chala gaya. He went to Singapore to work for four months. Four months ke baad aaya aur mujhe bola ki main daughter ke leke ja raha hu aur tumhe main one years ke baad le jaunga. He came back from Singapore after four months and he took my daughter away to Mumbai permanently and he told me that for one, after one year he'll come and take me back. After uh, I stayed with my in-laws, that is my father-in-law and the others for one year, but my father-in-law was sexually abusing me. He used to st uh, stay in front of me naked when nobody was there in the house. मैंने अपनी फैमिली में कहा तो वो लोग बोले कि मेरे फादर गलत नहीं है तुम गलत हो। I told my family members that my father-in-law is behaving like this with me, but nobody believed me. They said you are to be blamed, not my father. 
उसके बाद मुझे अचानक से इन लॉज ने कहा कि तुम्हें गांव जाना है फिर से then my in laws suddenly told me that i have to leave that house and go back to my own village lekin main is baar boli ki mujhe ab gaon nahi jana hai aage study karni hai aur apne job bhi karni hai apni padhai ke liye paise ikatthe karne but i refused to go back to my village because i said i want to study i want to work and i want to be financially stable लेकिन मेरे पास तो कोई पैसे नहीं थे ना मुझे पेरेंट्स सपोर्ट करते थे लेकिन मेरे फादर इन लो ने माना नहीं और उन्होंने घर से मुझे निकाल दिया आई डिट हैव एनी फिनेंशियल सपोर्ट आई डिट हैव एनी मनी एंड माई फादर इन लो पुट मी आउट ऑफ द हाउस और लॉक लगा दी मैं रोते हुए अपने ब्रदर के पास गई ही लॉक द रूम एंड पुट मी आउट एंड सो क्राइंग आई वेंट बैक टू माई ब्रदर्स प्लेस Uh, मैंने पुलिस कंप्लेन भी की लेकिन पुलिस वाले ने कुछ नहीं कहा और 15 डेज के बाद मेरे कपड़े और कुछ डॉक्यूमेंट्स वहां थे वो मुझे दिलवा दिया आई फाइल अ पुलिस कंप्लेन बट द पुलिस डिन डू एनीथिंग एक्सेप्ट दैट आफ्टर 15 डेज आई गॉट सम डॉक्यूमेंट्स एंड सम ऑफ माय बिलोंगिंग्स उसके बाद एक सीनियर ऑफिसर थे उन्होंने कहा कि आप केस इनको कर दो और आपको वहां से कुछ मिल जाएगा आफ्टर दिस अ सीनियर ऑफिसर फ्रॉम द पुलिस स्टेशन एडवाइज मी टू फाइल एन एप्लीकेशन टू द हाई कोर्ट एंड ही टोल्ड मी दैट आई विल गेट अ फ्री लीगल एडवाइजर और अ काउंसलर फ्री ऑफ चार्ज लेकिन मेरे मैंने कहा कि मेरे पास कोई पैसे नहीं तो उन्होंने कहा कि आपको लीगल ऐसे एडवोकेट मिल जाएगी वहां लेटर फॉर्म करने के बाद कोर्ट में आई टोल्ड हिम दैट आई हैव नो financial support i don't have any money but he again assured me that i will get everything free from the legal aid office that is the, from the court main wahan pe gayi maine letter form kiya aur mujhe sister sneha gil ke naam se ek mujhe letter mili wahan pe court ke liye i then filed an application and after 15 days i got a letter from sister sneha the legal advocate हाँ उन्होंने मेरी केस की डोमेस्टिक वायलेंस के ऊपर लेकिन पता नहीं था कि डाइवोर्स हो गई है मेरी ही फाइल्ड माय केस बट शी डिन नो एट दैट टाइम दैट आई वाज ऑलरेडी डिवोर्स्ड फिर कोर्ट के ऑर्डर से उन्होंने हाई कोर्ट की परमिशन लेके मिसिंग कंप्लेन करके मेरी बेटी का केस फाइल की हाई कोर्ट पे शी विथड्रॉ दैट केस दैट डिवोर्स केस फर्स्ट एंड देन शी फाइल्ड द missing complaint for my daughter and then the high court called my daughter and the husband into the court uske baad mere husband daughter leke court aaye high court mein then they came to the court the my husband and the daughter were brought to the court after this high court ki permission se mujhe beti se baat karne ka order pass hua aur milne ka bhi With the permission of the High Court, I was able to talk to my daughter after so long and also see my daughter. हाँ अभी मेरा केस चल रहा है लेकिन साथ में सिस्टर स्नेहा ने मुझे लॉ कॉलेज में एडमिशन करवाई. My case is still going on and Sister Sneha has uh, helped me to get law admission in the law college. Yes, मेरी second year सही अभी चल रही है. साथ में मैंने उनके लीगल ऑफिस में वर्क भी कर रही हूँ और कोर्ट में प्रैक्टिस भी कर रही हूँ आई एम डूइंग माई सेकेंड ईयर इन द लॉ कॉलेज एंड आई एम ऑल्सो एन ऑफिस असिस्टेंट फॉर सिस्टर स्नेहाज ऑफिस ऑल्सो आई एम गोइंग टू द कोर्ट फॉर लीगल प्रैक्टिस उनकी सपोर्ट से मैं स्टडी के लिए फी भी अरेंज कर रही हूँ और प्लस में अपनी रेंट भी दे रही हूँ रूम रेंट with the support of the salary that i get i am able to pay my rent and all my needs is uh, thank you sister sneha unki wajah se mujhe himmat mili nahi to case mein band kar rahi thi thank you sister sneha because of you i got lot of encouragement and motivation otherwise i wouldn't have done this so okay sister livania thank you जो आप मेरी ये स्टोरी इन इन लोगों के सामने रखी और मेरी स्टोरी इन लोगों ने मेरी सुनी तो लिवानिया थैंक यू फॉर हेल्पिंग मी टू पुट दिस स्टोरी इन फ्रंट ऑफ ऑल दिस पीपल हु हैव लिसन टू मी एंड हर्ड मी सो मैं काम करना चाहती हूँ आगे 
मैं कोई शादी नहीं करना चाहती हूँ मैं उन महिलाओं के लिए काम करना चाहती हूँ जो मेरी तरह ना समझ है और बिल्कुल गांव की हो जो बिल्कुल समझ में ना हो उन्हें कुछ भी I don't want to get married, but my desire is to work for the people, especially the ladies who are abused and battered and tortured, like me, and those who don't know how to read and write, and those who are unaware of their rights. I want to do this service to them after I finish my law. Yes, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Anshu. Thank you so much, Sister Sneha. Would you like to share with us? Uh, yeah, for me, I am so happy and delighted that we've got this opportunity today uh, to share who Anshu is. Uh, it's an opportunity for me to express as a presentation sister, being a legal advocate, doing the supportive work. I got, received Anshu as a legal aid counsel through Delhi Legal Aid Service. For three years, I was on the legal aid panel, and that is where I met her. And I have done such 30 cases that I'm talking for last 10 years. 30 women came and she's one of those battered and who struggled during the her domestic violence case. And I just want to ask the support system that we have been able to provide. As I did her domestic violence case, it is there when I registered the case in the district court, I realized that already by fraud, her husband has got a divorce decree, which she never knew the papers that she was signing. One was signed in the advocate's office, in his personal office. Second motion was signed where terms and conditions are written that he has settled all the dues with her which she was not aware, as she has rightly said. And what we also found out that as we were not able to track as a legal aid counsel, I struggled in the court. We had been sending for last two years, we call it notice from the court to track him. And he had been working in Mumbai in Wipro top company, but he's, kept changing his residence address. So we even to trace his residence proof, I had to intervene in Mumbai through a friend of mine who is into police uh, investigations. I got their support and through them, we realized that husband has been living with a changed name. The addresses have been changed, but he worked in the same company. So after two years, I persevered in the court, we tracked him. And when I tracked the re his actual address, it is there where I wanted to bring him to the court, to the high court. What we have in Delhi high court, we, I had to find a daughter. And therefore I, I filed a writ petition, habeas corpus, which is to produce her daughter. And in order to produce her daughter, the prosecution, the police had went to the Mumbai city, brought the husband and through Delhi and Mumbai police, they were able to coordinate. And within a week of my writ petition, they were produced in the high court. And we had, I had a tough fight in the court with him and Anshu was seeing her daughter after three years a separation of the mother and the daughter. And daughter did not know the drama. Husband is already married. He has got a, a, a second wife is there. They've got a child. And the husband seemed to have told the daughter that it's a second mother is your mother. And this lady is only trying to torture us and mentally harass you and me. So that this trauma that Anshu and her daughter went, and I also went through, uh, mental pressure, but there was a deep joy within us that finally, finally, we have been able to track him and we have found him. And therefore, I uh, we had also challenged the divorce petition in the family court. And presently, her DV petition is on. So in a in a way that we are we are giving her an assistant 
we decided that she would do the law study and she would also become a office girl for us an assistant she goes to the court she does our administrative work and she's getting on the job training and the emotional trauma that i had been going through myself went you know in a way that she has been able to understand the whole situation she is not into self pity the trauma that anshu and her daughter also went into the high court uh, the tug of war between the daughter and the mother and then between the husband and anshu that three hours she was given visiting rights so i still remember very very clearly vividly the scene where i got three hours for her where she could spend with her daughter and she just kept crying and while she was crying it is from there that within a week when we were able to get each one we were able to get into that remedy for her as the address has been tracked now, now our case is on a strong footing and therefore he comes to the court he has a legal aid counsel and we are in a position to give her emotional support moral support and she is one of the these strong uh, victim that actually she has been victimized but she is emerging as one of these strong cases that i have dealt last 10 years in my practice as a legal aid counsel and therefore today i as a presentation sister a daughter of nano feel proud that i have been able to do justice violence against women what we are talking uh, i continue to do this cases in the court and also we do counseling and she is the one when i get new other cases newer cases are coming she is able to counsel the case new victims she is able to address the issues with them she is able to take them to the police station she is able to become a support system for them and therefore for us it is a privilege and honor and she is wanting to be when i was talking to her it's a pride moment she she has rightly said and shared with all of us she does not want to get married but she says i will live my life as sisters as sister is living her life for the people i will become an advocate and i will empower so i think we have a very strong uh, presentation people journeying with us supporting our cause and she wants to be a partner with us in saving many more women who are into this trap so i think it's a great testimony for me a great witness and i continue to practice justice in the court outside the court we meet women and uh, on my record we have 50 such cases and even now the terrifying cases that we've got even today i i was uh, addressing two ca cases in the court so these are daily bread that i am going through and the trauma we i also get drained off end of the day there's lot of emotional draining and then the time factor the legal work demands uh, uh, more time commitment and it's a very different type of a ministry thank you and very so much sister sneha thank you so much thank for you. giving me the and thank you and uh, thank you uh, both uh, and anxious and you're accompanying her as a presentation sister that will will stay with us thank you very much uh, the work you have journeyed with her Uh, from day one, and I know that Andrew, there, there. Thank you for saying, sharing your story. So uh, I think it is appropriate this time, and thank you to Lebania also for accompanying her. Uh, I think we'll take a five minutes break here to stretch your legs. But following the five minute break, when we come back, we'll take that photograph and then we'll continue. So I hope you do come back uh, within the five minutes. So just take a pause because a. Uh, that story uh, it, it hits our uh, us in uh, both in our hearts so we need to pause 
So thank you. Just in five minutes break. Thank you. Elizabeth, you can mute yourself now. Elizabeth and Jacqueline, if you put your microphone on to mute now. Spina, uh, when you go to take the photograph, uh, I suppose you'll have to take a few screens because we have a few uh, screens. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. We'll take it as soon as I see people back again. And then I will go straight into the, um, the Red Dot Foundation Partnership. So at this point, we are about to gather for the photograph. So uh, I'm conscious that some people may not want to be in it, but for those who are, have their screens blocked at the moment and would like to be in it, maybe they would uh, put back on their videos. Thank you. Marie, I'll give some 30 seconds for people to. <laughs> yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, cameras. I just want to say, Jacqueline and uh, and Anshu, that uh, in the chat box, the sisters have been so inspired by your sharing and, uh, and, and, and also giving a word, a great word of gratitude to Sneha for her accompanying and for Elizabeth and Philippania for accompanying them. So it, it is indeed the work of Nano Nagel that, that, uh, that is happening. So now I think we are nearly, if we, I know Maureen O'Connell is, would be in the photograph, but she's not back yet. I just see there. Maureen, are you there? And while I'm waiting, I just want to say to that Sister Joyce Meyer is on this webinar and she has put in the chat that uh, the story of Papua New Guinea lately written by um, Sister Anne Lane uh, and also uh, the, the Baggio people in the Philippines. Uh, Global Sisters have covered them and they're available on Global Sisters and very inspiring to read. Um, so I um, just to, to alert you to that. And thank you, Joyce, for bringing that to our attention. And thank you, Joyce, for all you do to promote the different uh, missions of, of, of presentation, of your own presentation across the world. So 
So we're just awaiting just Maureen O'Connell, are you there? So I think uh, just being we will have to go about taking that photograph. Thank you. Okay. So everyone. Yes, all, all, all ready. Yes, Brian. Yeah. <laughs> One, two, three. Yes. Are you then, for me? Yeah, just to look at your camera. That's fine. Oh, yeah. I, there you go. Yeah, thank you. Give me one moment to take the rest. Smile. <laughs> have so many participants so <laughs> yes yeah. that's a good thing so here goes the fourth page and then the last one okay so we're done <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Justina. Thank you. So now we're going to move on and we hold those sacred <laughs> stories with us. They brought us to a different place. So uh, we, we're going to move on now to uh, recall our Seventh Assembly uh, commitment, number 10, which said it calls us to continue to work towards collaboration and partnership building. So IPA has, in, has partners, partnered with the Red Dot Foundation State City Initiative which honours our 10 commitment. The initiative forms part of the work to honour our UN advocacy focus. And the slide that you're viewing at the moment is the initial meeting uh, with uh, Ella Maria Silva, the founder of the, and president of the Red Dot Foundation and uh, the Red Dot Foundation NGO, Lespina and I met with them. And then with one, and here, here in August, we had a training session and uh, Elizabeth and Melda and Karina uh, and uh, joined us uh, and Anne, of course, uh, with uh, Elsa Maria and Gillian and Espina and I for a training session. And next month, uh, Elizabeth and Melda and Karina will lead uh, uh, the, using the WhatsApp in, uh, in Papua New Guinea. But uh, in a few moments, uh, I will be inviting um, Despina to speak further on that. So I think we're okay at the moment then, Despina. Would you continue to just share a little bit further on the Safe City Initiative, but also on the IPA pilot project in Ireland, which Brian O'Toole is the focal point for, and Brian O'Toole, Brian will also speak. So over to you, Despina, thank you. Uh, Marie, thank you so much. So, um... So uh, Anne-Marie and I uh, decided to build a new, a new partnership with the Red Dot Foundation, an NGO accredited um, uh, with an ECOSOC status like the IPA. So since uh, September 2021, the IPA has officially entered into this partnership. Their mission is to end uh, violence against women and girls using crowdsources data, uh, community engagement and institutional accountability. Their flagship program is called Safe City, an online platform that crowdsources personal stories of sexual harassment and abuse in, uh, in public spaces. Uh, what they do is they advocate to create awareness on abuse and sexual harassment against women in India and get women and other disadvantaged uh, communities to break their silence and uh, report their personal uh, experiences. Um, sexual violence is an entire spectrum of abuse, yet we tend to ignore the verbal and non-verbal abuse, deeming them to be too trivial, uh, when in fact it can be equally um, debilitating to many, uh, limiting their choices, movements, uh, affecting their mental health. Um, I remember when I was um, discussing with the UN representative for the Red Dot Foundation uh, about, you know, potentially building uh, a future collaboration and partnership. Uh, she was uh, saying that um, uh, what they have learned in the, nine, in the last nine years uh, since the safe city has existed is that there is a poor understanding of what constitutes the spectrum of sexual violence 
or how it is intentionally uh, targeted uh, towards a, a particular gender. Through breaking it down into categories ranging from nonverbal, verbal uh, to the physical forms, they are actually providing a vocabulary to one's uh, experiences. <laughs> uh, the Safe City platform, uh, it was launched in December 2012 as an immediate response uh, to the gang um, uh, rape of a young woman on a bus in Delhi. Uh, Safe City is available on the web and also as an application on Android and iOS app stores. It is a free platform and does not require the user to register a name, or an email or phone number, nothing. So people can anonymously share their stories regarding an incident, uh, uh, location, date, and time. Uh, unfortunately, many of these um, uh, violations uh, occur on a daily basis, and it has become so normalized um, that one believes that it is part of, of our daily routine and we should accept it as it is. Um, instead, uh, we change our behavior. Uh, adjust our routines, uh, restrict our mobility. This promotes a culture of insecurity, which further perpetuates uh, harmful norms that limit uh, women and girls. Do not go out late, uh, do not wear short clothes, uh, spaces are unsafe to go, so stay at home. You know, do not speak up because you bring shame to yourself or your family. These are some examples that all of us women and girls have heard. Um, however, with Safe City, we are trying to break that silence and bridge the data gap that exists. Um, the official statistics do not reflect uh, the true nature and the size of the problem. Uh, and by documenting their story anonymously, it is the first step in acknowledging the incident occurred. And actually, we make it visible. Each story is uh, plotted on the map and uh, visualized with others as uh, hotspots. And this data can be analyzed further to understand um, location-based patterns and identify factors that contribute to behavior that uh, leads to violence in order to work on uh, strategies uh, for solutions. Um, so uh, these are some of the categories that are being mapped. Um, and there's also a detailed help information page, very useful, listed uh, country-wise uh, with useful emergency numbers uh, from local hospitals, police stations, helplines, legal aid info. Um, the data can be used to start a conversation with specific key stakeholders or civic uh, authorities on what could be the solutions or um, to inform or change policies in addressing or preventing violence. And this data enables citizens, communities, authorities, um, police and policymakers to create uh, safer spaces. Um, the, the aim is to make this information available in the public domain so that people can be more uh, situationally aware and make better choices for their safety. They can uh, um, mobilize communities around an issue get them to take a stand and uh, find uh, local neighborhood solutions or um, demand account accountability with service providers. Simple solutions uh, that encourage individual action, focus on community engagement and drive uh, institutional accountability. Um, I thank you. So, uh, Anne Marie, would you like me to continue with Brian? No, no yes, no, I was, yes, I, yes, I hope you would introduce Brian there, the pilot project in Ireland. Thank you, Stina. Okay, thank you so much, Anne Marie. And uh, as Anne Marie mentioned earlier, Ireland is the first IPA country that started uh, on a pivotal um, trial basis uh, to engage in the Safe City project. Uh, before handing the microphone over to, to Brian O'Toole, our just contact for Ireland and England, who will share with us some aspects of this project in the pilot country. Um, as he's our local focal point, I would like to note that uh, starting January 2022, more IPA countries will be engaged with Safe City. Uh, partnering with uh, Red Dot Foundation on the Safe City project will uh, enable 
the IPA to establish uh, regional networks uh, of knowledge and expertise to boost regional capacity and um, uh, strengthen support to local advocacy efforts. Uh, additionally, this uh, will provide um, uh, tangible results, uh, solutions actually, uh, for safer communities uh, where the IPA has a presence um, by requesting certain government uh, or municipal policy measures. Um, in the meantime, please uh, feel free to spread the word to your communities, explore what the Safe City platform is, how it works, identify its usefulness in your local context and um, feel free to contact me for questions or any further information. I would, I would be more than happy to discuss with you about this new partnership and how we, you can engage in the near future. Um, with that being said, Brian, the floor is yours. Um, thanks, Jaspina. Um, and the first thing I'll say is I'm delighted to hear that from January, there will be more IPA countries involved. Um, we're privileged to be one of the first IPA countries to be involved in the Safe City Red Dot Foundation program, pilot program. But the very first thing I had to do was I had to try and figure out what exactly the app was. So the very first thing I did was I downloaded the app that Despina was speaking about. And I had to see how it worked. I needed to understand it for myself. So I downloaded it and I had a go at every aspect of it. And the first thing I found out is that it was really, really simple. It wasn't difficult. It was probably one of the easiest apps I'd ever downloaded. Anybody could do it. So the next thing I had to do was to try and figure out how am I going to get this app onto the telephone of all of the sisters in Ireland and on, onto the phones of those who are linked to my work as an IPA justice contact, that was the hard part. And I had to think, how am I going to do that? So once I kind of learned about the app and download and became much more familiar with every aspect of it, I went on to the, the Safe City Red Dot website that um, Despina spoke about. And I went up and down the website and I learned all about it. And what really enthused me and energized me about this app is that it wasn't just words. This was now deeds. This is a practical expression of how we can together work for the elimination of violence against women and children. In fact, work for the elimination of violence against anybody. So I began to look at where it is already being used in the world. And I had to say to myself, well, why am I interested? Because once I found out why I'm interested, then perhaps I could explain why I think other people should be interested in not just downloading the app, but using the app as well. Well, firstly, I'm interested because it's an IPA initiative. Secondly, I'm interested because it's a, a practical expression of our support of those who suffer from violence behind closed doors. And if ever that was important, it's always important, but perhaps during COVID that that has become an even greater um, difficulty that is uh, needs to be needs to be looked at and needs to have a light shone upon it. I also worked as part on the submission to the Irish Universal Periodic Review relative to domestic violence. So I learned an awful lot more about the effects of violence. And I can now see a greater need for an app that would allow for the anonymous reporting of incidences of violence and that this could be done anonymously in such a way as to try and help those who plan and work for others to eliminate the uh, incidence of violence. Another step that I took before I did anything, before I rolled it out to anybody was, I met with Despina and I had my list of questions for Despina, some easy, some hard, but all answered. I also met with Anne-Marie, I sat in her office and I answered, I asked Anne-Marie questions up and down. I really just had to get my head around it because I felt at some stage, somebody's going to ask me a hard question and I needed to know the answer to it, which is exactly what I did. But the one thing I really wanted to do was, I had to try and make it easy for anybody to download the app and to understand not just how to use it, but why it's important to use it. So if you move on to the next slide, then we can see that the two slides that you're seeing are two parts of one page that I created, a web page, which is just a link. And the reason I wanted that was if I can get a web link onto somebody's phone, then I can get them to download this app. I had to make it easy for them to download the app. So I tested the app and I tested it on the Apple and on the Android. And the first thing I did was I rang up friends of mine and I said to them, I'm going to send you this email and I'm going to send you this page. 
tell me, what do you think? Do you think you can understand it? And they had nothing to do with IPA. So I sent them the link and they came back and said, oh, you need to move this here or change this, but I know what you're trying to do. I had to try and make it as understandable as I could. So once I was happy with the email I was going to send with the link, I, I sent it to a project in Dublin city centre that I worked with when we were looking at the incidents of violence for the Irish Universal Periodical Review. And I asked them if they would share it amongst their staff, because the chances are they're working in a space where they may come across incidents of violence against anybody. And once we kind of explained what was expected, they were only too delighted to be of help. And they asked, could they share it on, which was made me even happier, because the whole point of this is once you hear about it, pass it on. Don't keep it to yourself. Why would you keep good news to yourself? The joy is to share it on. And that's the value of this. Not one person or one small group to have it shared widely. That's where the real rich learnings come from. I also shared it with the sisters in Ireland and England, and I've asked them not once, twice, three times, maybe 10 times. Every time I'm on, I ask them, please share the email. So if there are any sisters from Ireland sitting and watching this, I hope you have your app on your phone. If you haven't, I know now you haven't, <laughs> and I'll be back to find out why it's not on your phone. So that's what we're saying. Because we're in Ireland, we are the first to have it. You can't make a mistake with the app, so don't worry about it. Download it and have a go. The next step now is to contact others who were involved in the university periodical period review and ask them to share the app. On the end of my email, I will be putting it down. Please share the app. Every time I speak to somebody, my first question is, hello, how are you? Have you downloaded the app? Do you know what <laughs> it does? This is what it's about. This is how we can share. And one of the reasons I kind of went to a lot of trouble to get this because this is not just words, this is deeds. So this is nano in action. So at our UN focus, a lot of what we do is, is about words and about expressing an opinion and advancing our case. But this is a practical expression of how we can make a real step together to eliminate the violence against women and children. So as it stands, I can be as enthusiastic as I want. I can encourage as many people to download it and they might download it. What I can't actually do is make them use it. And the only thing I hope that can happen is that if people are listening in, they can kind of say, well, actually, this is a good thing. This is something that can make a difference. So that's why I'm encouraging everybody not just to download it, because we all have apps on our phone. Some of them we don't use that often. Some of them we use all the time. But all we're saying is if you download this, please, please use it. So I suppose my own experience is that we're kind of, it's a slow progress process and we're doing quite well. It's going to take a while to get up and running. But once we get the information in, then we will be able to share it with others. And it may help the police. It may help the planners make the city safer. It may offer tips to people who live in certain parts of Dublin or Cork or Galway, where, where are safe places to be. The benefits are, we're only, are, we're only really getting to the grips of what might be the beginnings of the benefits, but I do think that uh, there's a lot of learning to go. So just to say once again, that really this app is a practical expression of our motto, not just words, but deeds. So maybe I'll stop at that point, but uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Brian, and, and thank you for your, for your passion for us. And, and I'm very aware that you hit the ground running when we asked you to engage in this uh, initiative. And, uh, you know, uh, you have provided also great resources uh, uh, on your website uh, that we can all use. And again, uh, not words, but deeds. So thank you very much, Brian. I could say so much more, but we have to keep moving on. But just to say also that our sisters in Papua New Guinea, Elizabeth, uh, Amelda and Karina and, and Anne, who is part of the group, uh, in the training, they also had wonderful passion and they will, begin, they will be taking it on board shortly as well. So there'll be Ireland and Papua New Guinea uh, starting off and uh, followed by the others. Uh, on Monday and Tuesday of next week, we'll be meeting with groups of the Justice Context and part of that meeting will be to speak further on this safe, safe program uh, as part of the meeting. So I, I just have very conscious of time, very conscious that we're holding you. But so I'd like to move on now to introduce Ella Raymond. Ella is our IPA Research Fellow and over the next six months, 
Ella under the Spina's supervision will conduct research on gender stereotypes and domestic violence. And Ella is joining us from England. So if you're there, Ella, please come in. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, so there's a PowerPoint, which if Despina can, ah, oh, brilliant. Thank you, Ella. Perfect. Okay, so yes, hello, everyone. Um, yes, I'm Ella Raymond. I'm the new research fellow for the IPA. Um, so if we if we move to the next slide, um, this research uh, aims to identify gender stereotypes in three chosen countries. So it's the US, India and Zimbabwe. And more specifically, how patriarchal gender stereotypes shape attitudes and experiences of domestic violence. Gender stereotypes shape how survivors internalize gender-based violence. So this research will identify how support-seeking behavior is affected by gender stereotypes for um, intersectional groups. As COVID-19 has exacerbated both gender stereotypes and domestic violence, this research will also examine the different responses to domestic violence at different levels, both before and during the pandemic. Ultimately, these aims are to further develop and support the already existing IP, IPA advocacy plan for how to tackle domestic violence and protect survivors through an analysis of domestic violence in three countries. So those were the research aims, if we could, perfect. Um, so the three countries, they represent different regions of the world along with distinct cultural and social factors that influence gender stereotypes. <coughs> this slide features statistics of OECD data illustrating <coughs> attitudes or experiences of gender-based violence in each of the countries. Um, so the data is from 2019. Uh, so this project aims to identify how harmful patterns of gender stereotypes have shifted under COVID-19 restrictions, specifically the stay at home policies that see survivors sheltering with their abusers. So briefly, uh, the United, oh, sorry, just, <laughs> um, okay, um, I'll read from the, the previous slide. Um, the United States has 35.6% of ever partnered women have suffered physical and or sexual violence. Um, in India, 75% of women agree with the statement that when a mother works for pay, the children suffer. And in Zimbabwe, 35.4% of women believe a husband to be justified in physically disciplining his wife for specific reasons. So those, that's the, a kind of brief justification of the countries chosen. Um, now moving to the next slide. Um, so in order to conduct this research, this project is taking a mixed methods approach using both a quantitative questionnaire and qualitative semi-structured interviews. To ensure that the research aims are addressed, the collection of data is broken down into five distinct categories, including how socio-cultural factors affect gender-based violence and specifically patriarchal gender stereotypes experiences of gender-based violence before COVID-19 and during COVID-19 in order to establish correlation for how the pandemic has affected gender stereotypes and domestic violence and assessing experiences of domestic violence towards children along with establishing the role of intergenerational violence on experiences of domestic violence. And finally, this research will assess how perceptions of gender stereotypes correlate with experiences of domestic violence. This slide presents just a brief overview um, from the literature research of ways in which patriarchal ideology perpetuates domestic violence um, through harmful gender stereotypes. Uh, there are contextual differences to how these factors manifest um, in each of the case studies, but they provide an overview to how gender stereotypes tangibly affect people across the world. And if that's a little tough to read, I'll um, just briefly read them out. So we have relationships of dominance and subordination, restricting autonomy to the private sphere, acceptability of violence, a culture of silence and stigma, unequal decision-making autonomy and unequal dependence. So these are just a few examples of how patriarchal gender stereotypes shape experiences and perceptions of domestic violence. So for this six month project, which will be completed mid-March, um, I'm currently at the phase of conducting primary research under the supervision of Despina. Um, so if you feel that you or people you know have experiences of domestic violence or harmful gender stereotypes in 
either the United States or Zimbabwe, please feel free to contact either myself or Despina. Uh, our emails are, are on this slide. Uh, as this project aims to center the experiences of survivors in order to tackle domestic violence. Thank you for listening. Uh, and I look forward to sharing this project with you at a later date. Thank you very much, um, uh, Ella. And I know you had to put, you had to rush uh, that presentation, but thank you for what you're doing. And uh, also, uh, I hope that many people will take part in your interviews that you'll be shortly beginning, you know? So thank you, Ella. And, Sorry for uh, interrupting. Uh, I know that uh, we don't have, I mean, we, we are uh, reached, we have reached our time. That's why I, I, I didn't say a few words about the project uh, and Anne-Marie said instead, just to answer to uh, a comment that I saw in the chat box. We, um, in this uh, research project, we designed to capture experiences of both men and women uh, who have been living with an intimate partner before or during COVID and the reason for engaging men as well is that uh, we believe that men need to be also seen as agents of change for the achievement of gender equality. Uh, men and boys can be part of the solution to eliminate violence against women and girls. And because, you know, gender equality is everyone's responsibility. That's just a comment that I had on Marie and apologies for interrupting you. I saw the, um, the comment in the chat box. Not at all, it's been it's very important to pick that up. As a matter of fact, we are now going to have an open conversation. We'll have a little time and uh, Despina, there may be other questions in the chat box that you may uh, keep an eye on there and, and bring to our attention. So uh, for, for the next 10 minutes or 15 minutes, uh, 10 minutes, I'd say, just to have an open conversation because you've been listening to attentively to, to so much uh, for the last hour and two quarters nearly. Uh, so if anybody uh, would like to um, engage in the conversation and if there's, been a, is there, if there's anything else that you want to pick up there from the chat box. Uh, and thank you for picking up that, that one you've just addressed there. Thank you. Yes, I see Anne-Marie, one question from Kerry. Uh, about the, the application, I suppose, uh, if it can be used to report uh, an act of violence, uh, either you witness it or someone else uh, experiences. Uh, yes, you can do both. Uh, we all know that um, uh, gender-based violence survivors are you know, often not very comfortable into uh, reporting their experience. And uh, we are here to help, you are there to help them. And uh, please feel free to, to do that instead of them and uh, support them in that way as well. Thank you. So anybody else like to engage in the conversation, maybe something that has touched you uh, throughout the last hour and three quarters? I don't know if you can see me, but I do have my hand raised. It's yeah, oh, yes, I, I do. And thank you, uh, thank you, Dart, for bringing that to attention. Because just to say to people that there is a button at the bottom where you can hit reactions, it's, it's a face. And if you hit that, we will see your hand up. So right. apologies, yeah. uh, Darty. Because we're on different screens, there are four screens, you know, uh, if you right. put uh, reactions in. Thank you, Darty. Uh, okay. No, I just want to say how excited I am. I cannot believe that we are at this point. The um, reports from the three different focus groups really energized me because I can remember when we were dreaming all of this and here we really are we are in the midst of really doing wonderful things so I just want to thank the Spina and you Anne Marie for all the hard work of putting this webinar together I'm just so thrilled that it's it's just moving right ahead doing Nano's work so thank you so much Thank you, Mitch. Thank you very much, Dar Dorothy, and thank you. And thank you for your beautiful video greeting uh, for presentation day from the Windsor uh, congregation. Thank you very thank much, you. Dorothy. Uh, like any other say, hand? Uh, I'll try to look up for a hand or a voice. Yeah, Teresa Teresa. Horrigan wants to speak. Yeah. Teresa, <laughs> please do, Teresa. Thanks very much to all the speakers today. And I feel very happy and very proud of being part of the IPA and knowing that we are all united in this great work and that we are being blessed by the 18th Sustainable Development Goal and praying for each other. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Teresa.
Anybody else there? Please feel free to come in. Could, could I suggest that we change violence against women and children to include all people? Um, it's, it's not just, I think we have to be more inclusive in our approach. And um, if we look at who, at the causes of violence, who inflicts the violence, who are the perpetrators, I think maybe we need to include all the people that are involved, whether they be victims or perpetrators. I think a more restorative approach would be more in line with our vision, I think, than, than the more legal one. I think there's a whole area of um, restoration and relationship building here that um, sometimes I feel if we include any members of society, we create another problem. So I'd like to suggest a more inclusive approach for all are uh, included in, 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 the, uh, in this issue of violence against humanity, really. Thank you very much, Melda. And we definitely will bring that uh, forward from, from today's uh, public event. Thank you. So if, if, if you're OK, I think we'll move on, because I don't want to, to, for the webinar to go on too long, the way you come back to another one. Uh, so um, as time is moving on, what I would like to take a few moments now and invite Richard Rogus, he's the Justice Contact from Queensland, Australia, to end our time together by leading us in a reflection on what we are doing in the context of the State Development Goals and our founding presentation story. So it's over to you, Richard, and you're welcome. I heard you have a red shirt on you. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Um, let us begin in prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The fifth sustainable development goal is gender equality. This goal aims to end all forms of discrimination and violence against women and to enhance the status of women and girls in societies around the world. Gender equality is not only a fundamental human right, but a necessary foundation for a peaceful, prosperous and sustainable world. There has been progress over the last decades. More girls are going to school. Fewer girls are forced into early marriage. More women are serving in parliament and positions of leadership and laws are being reformed to advance gender equality. But despite these gains, many challenges remain. Discriminatory laws and social norms remain pervasive. Women continue to be underrepresented at all levels of political leadership. One in five women and girls between the ages of 15 and 49 report experiencing physical or sexual violence by an intimate partner. 71% of all human trafficking victims worldwide are women and girls. And three out of four of these women and girls are sexually exploited. The COVID-19 pandemic has intensified violence against women and children and exacerbated existing inequalities for women and girls across every sphere, from health and the economy to security and social protection. So let us pause for a moment to bring to mind the stories that we have heard today. What are the needs of women and children to which we are being called to respond locally, nationally, and globally? Nano had a tremendous sense of mission and purpose in life, specifically directed to the poor and the downtrodden. As well as her work in the schools, Nano visited homeless and sick women 
in their homes, their garrets, their mud cabins, bringing them her compassionate presence and whatever help she could. She put her life at risk as she trod the unlit alleyways of Cork at night by the light of a dim lantern. Raphael Considine describes the range of Nano's concerns. Who were the poor through whom the ongoing call to conversion sounded in Nano's heart and to whose service and evangelization she gave herself with so much insight energy and practicality. They were, of course, the children of Cork's poorest districts, but they were also the sick, lonely and aged whom she visited and tended in the public infirmaries and in their garrets. The prostitutes whom she was slandered for knowing and for whom she longed to build a refuge. The elderly women for whom she did build a home, the Irish exiles in the West Indies for whom she trained catechists, the adults to whom she gave religious instruction. They were those disconsolate widows, forlorn orphans, reduced housekeepers, superannuated tradesmen, whose various afflictions she assuaged, whose tears she dried up, whose wants she so often satisfied. Nano was in touch with the experiences of people who were poor and pushed to the margins. She was in touch with their experiences of hopelessness and despair. She was attentive to their needs for education, for faith development, for a soothing word, or a soothing hand. She was attentive to the political and social realities that created extreme poverty and dispossession. She was attuned to where political power was exercised. She was attuned to the church and its evolving role in Irish society towards the end of the penal laws. She was attentive to the practical everyday necessities of keeping her schools functioning and establishing two religious congregations in Cork to ensure the ongoing effectiveness of these schools. She was attentive to the call of God's spirit in the ordinary everyday realities of her life. She did not look for extraordinary signs and wonders to make her way to God. She was attentive to God in the daily relationships, commitments, and activities of daily life and discerned God's presence there. How are we called to respond to the needs of women and children in our time and place? How can we build stronger together and keep enacting Nano's mission to work for justice in our world? So let us pray each life and childhood has been shaped and touched by women. Over time, the stories of women and children may have been ignored or forgotten, but today we claim their worth. We celebrate the voices of women and children, proclaiming wisdom. We honour the lives of women and children, forging new paths. We remember the faith of women and children, strong in the face of adversity. We anticipate the vision of women and children calling us into the future. 
So let us say together. Past, past present, present and, future, and future. Our, our lives, lives join, join women and women, children, children everywhere. everywhere. We give thanks for all women and children who have been part of God's holy story. For leaders and liberators like Miriam, Deborah and Esther. For poets and prophets like Hulda, Anna, Mary and Hannah. For apostles and activists like Mary Magdalene, Lydia and Priscilla. And for the named and the nameless, Talitha Kum, all vital to the story. We give thanks also for women whose gifts of strength, imagination, wisdom and compassion have been a tree of life for us. We are witnesses to the many ways that the lives of women and children contribute to the ongoing story of God's eternal love. We remember especially those on the margins, struggling for peace and justice. So please join in these responses. For women and children whose hearts are broken. We will reach out now. For women and children who mourn. We will stand with them. For women and children yearning for good news. We will, we will speak, speak out. out. For women and children striving for freedom. We will seek justice. justice. And together, in the ministry of Jesus, Jesus and that of Nano, Nano. the dignity of women and children was a forever. Jesus entrusted women the good news. Nano entrusted women the ministry and broken. May our work acknowledge dignity and rights of all women and children in our world and contribute to the elimination of gender based discrimination and violence. Let us seek the empowerment of women and children, and children so that they may experience God's justice. Amen. Amen. We conclude this prayer with the sign of the cross in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, for bringing us to, into this space at the end of our webinar, which was, which was a very inspiring and very sacred. So it comes to me to, to have the, our, the final few words of thanks. Uh, I would like to, first of all, thank yourselves. Uh, the, without you, uh, we, we would be here, um, you know, just not, it was so important to have so many from across the IPA network and beyond. I'd like to quote what Nelson Mandela's belief was, that together we are stronger, that change can happen when people collectively take action to make a world a better place. And that is what we each in our own way are trying to do to make the world a better place. I want to sincerely thank again to Jacqueline and Ansu for sharing their sacred stories with us and to Elizabeth, Sneha and Banya who companioned them and continue to companion them. My thanks again to, my, to, to the webinar uh, planning team that worked closely with me, uh, to Gemma, Maureen and Brian. My sincere thanks to my justice contacts who are the justice contacts from each of the congregation and units. Uh, your commitment and resilience over the past year has been inspiring. So I'd like to end now by uh, also thanking Despina. Uh, Despina, as I mentioned earlier, had many tasks. She was, she was the, the Zoom platform moderator, and which took an awful lot of work and, and attention, but she also presented. And uh, I want to take the opportunity to thank her for her ongoing work as our IPA NGO at the UN. 
Despina, I, you're not on my screen, but I know you're there. So a big thank you, Despina, for, for all for today and all you, you continue to do. And last but not least, I want to introduce to you the incoming uh, program action leader who will begin next uh, Monday. Uh, Christopher, could you put up your hand and make yourself known there if we try to get you on the screen, please? Is Hi, good there? morning. Good afternoon, everybody. The, Am I on the screen there. here? Yes, yes. If, if people could move their, their slides and see Christopher. Christopher, I would like to take this opportunity. Uh, you were, I was so glad that you were able to join us today, uh, even though you're not starting your, your position until next Monday. But uh, in conversation with, with Christopher, we thought it would be a real opportunity to see the work of, uh, that is happening at this time. And uh, from next Monday, Christopher will be accompanying, in particular, the justice context in their work and working closely with the SPINA and I and uh, into the future with many others. So you're very welcome, uh, Christopher, and thank you for, for being here. So thank we you. will uh, we will be meeting Christopher, the justice context and I and with one group on next Monday, another group on Tuesday. So, so thank you, Christopher. So I think we will end our webinar with the, with the, with the words of we, we go as orange our world now for the elimination of violence against women. And thank you to each and all uh, for your presence here today uh, as, a, as an IPA network and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I love them all in Staten Island. Thank you, Anne Marie and team. Thank you, Anne Marie. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Lemonia. Nice to see you. Well done, Marie. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Mary. Hi, Annalise. Hi, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Well, Thanks very much, Thank you, Emily, and your team. That's very nice. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank, Thank you, Lily. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Emily. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well Bye. done. Bye. Thank you, Lynn. Good night. Thank, Thank, Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. I'm going to bed. Thank you. Thank you. See you next week. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. See you. Bye. 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 Hey, yeah, thank you. And our just first, Neha. Yes, and, and, and Joe, Hi. I saw Joe there. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Blanche's <laughs> time.